Oh, you who believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah, the pleasure of Allah. Oh, you who believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan, night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan, it is Ramadan, it is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah be upon you all. And welcome to this, the first in a series of interviews and question and answer sessions regarding Ramadan, entitled Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. I am your host, Yusuf Chambers. I myself will be interviewing Dr. Zakia Naik and asking him your questions regarding important topics to do with Ramadan. Ramadan has a very special place in my own heart. Sixteen years ago, after a struggle of more than ten years, I stumbled upon Muslims deep in the worship of Allah during this blessed month, Ramadan. After a struggle of more than 10 years, I went through Christianity, Hinduism, Jainism, materialism, socialism, and many other isms that you and I wouldn't even recognize, even if I tried to tell you, you wouldn't recognize them. SubhanAllah. Now, brothers and sisters, during this blessed month of Ramadan, Allah revealed the last testament, His last testament to mankind, the Qur'an. And the Qur'an is still with us. Can you imagine this? This is why this month of Ramadan is so special to the Muslims, not just the Muslims, but non-Muslims. Indeed, I came to Islam during this blessed month, for when I encountered Muslims that were not practicing their deen, and then suddenly they started practicing in that one month, I felt obliged to look into the books of Islam and search for the truth. I found the truth and a few days later I started fasting. A few days later I took the shahada. Alhamdulillah, this blessed Islam is just too good for people to overlook. Brothers and sisters, Ramadan, the month of mercy, the month of forgiveness, the month when the blessed Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this series of programs is so incredibly important for you and for me to make sure that we observe and we watch. In this program, as I said, I will be your host, brothers and sisters, and I will be joined every single day by a person who you do not need much of an introduction to, his acumen and his profession. Originally, he was a medical doctor, trained as a medical doctor. And once he told me that he considered himself to be a medical doctor, a doctor of the human body. Latterly, he explained to me that I became a doctor of the human soul. And this is obviously a reference to the fact that Quran and Sunnah had entered his heart and he had felt the need to give dawah upon that. For the last 11 years, my dear brothers and sisters, he has delivered over a thousand lectures on the international arena, on television, print-based media, radio, and he's the author of many important books on the topic comparative religion and Islam. His critical analysis and his ability to quote verbatim from many religious scriptures the world over being all of the major religions in the world, my dear brothers and sisters, is unparalleled. Therefore, he's a resource for humanity. And I furthermore would suggest that without further ado, I should invite him to join us. Dr. Zakia Abdul Karim Naik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kif haraki. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Please have a seat. Jazakallah. 
Dr. Sakia, is there any information that you need to impart to the viewers of Peace TV before we start this long series of interviews and question and answer sessions regarding Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahibi ajma'in. Amma abad, a'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbi shahri sadri wa yasalli amri wa ahlul uddat min lisani yafqahu kawli. Before we start this long series of episodes, Ramadan date with Dr. Zakir, I would like to make my position very clear that I consider myself to be a student of knowledge. I consider myself to be a talib ilm. I don't consider that I'm a scholar to give fatwas. That's why Islam ruling is concerned. And as far as this topic on Ramadan, there are various issues and there are various differences of opinions as far as different scholars are concerned, as far as different schools of thought are concerned. Since there are only four verses in the Quran dealing directly with Ramadan, that's Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 83, verse number 184, verse number 185, and verse number 187. There are indirectly another few verses, but directly only four verses. So most of the rulings are based on the hadith. And some scholars have used Zaif hadith, some have used Maudu hadith, some have used Sai hadith. So as far as what I'll be answering, it will basically be the views of different scholars. Only I'll be selecting those scholars who I feel have quoted on the basis of Quran and Sai hadith. So it may not agree with some of the viewers' view, which they're used to. Our opinion should always be based on Quran and Say Hadith. When required, I may give the difference of opinion to different scholars. I'll name the scholars if required. Most of the time, I may not name. But I'd like to make it very clear at the outset that all the answers as far as Ramadan issues are concerned, none of them are my own answers. They are basically some of the other scholars who have said it. And I'll try my level best to name the scholars whenever required so that no one feels that I'm trying to give my own opinion. But I always believe that the answer should be based on Quran and Say Hadith. So that I'll try my level best. And inshallah, as far as possible, whenever I quote Hadith, I will try and give the references, whether some say Bukhari or say Muslim, the volume number, as well as the Hadith number, so that people can, you know, check it up. And as far as possible, the Hadith I'll be quoting will be authentic. And similarly with the verses of the Quran. And that's my normal method of giving replies so that people, whenever they get the answer, they get from authentic source of Quran and say hadith. And whatever right or good that comes out from my mouth will be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever wrong and mistakes that come from my mouth will be from my side and from the side of the shaitan. So I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may this series be beneficial for all of us, including the viewers, inshallah. Ameen. Jazakallah khair. Now to the show. This show comprises of two separate parts. The first part will be a live interview between myself and Dr. Zakir Naik regarding the topic, a chosen topic about Ramadan. And the second part will be your questions answered by Dr. Zakir Naik on the particular topic of the day. Alhamdulillah. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to review the list of topics that we will be discussing, inshallah, over the next 32 days. And by the way, brothers and sisters, you might be wondering why on earth we're covering 32 days. Are we strange? No, we're not strange. In actual fact, we're so concerned about all the brothers and sisters all in different parts of the world that, of course, that Ramadan occurs at slightly different days, one day here and there, different. So we're covering all the world and all the Muslims, inshallah. May Allah accept it from us, inshallah. Right, without further ado, let's go through the list then, brothers and sisters. The first day, topic number one, episode number one, will be, let's welcome Ramadan. That's today. The second episode, common errors committed by Muslims during Ramadan. The third, introduction to Ramadan. The fourth, when is fasting obligatory? and exempted. Number five, acts that invalidate the fast and acts prohibited during fasting. Number six, acts permitted during fasting. Number seven, acts recommended and discouraged during fasting. Number eight, suhoor and iftar. Number nine, objectives of fasting. Number 10, benefits of fasting. Episode number 11, Ramadan, the month of repentance. And 12, Ramadan, 
the month of supplications. Number 13 and 14, Kiyama Leil, part one and two. Number 15, that's almost, well, that's halfway through Ramadan, brothers and sisters. Ramadan, the month of the Quran, part one. Number 16, Ramadan, the month of the Quran, part two. 17, Zakah, part one. 18, Zakah, part two. 19, Zakah, part three. Number 20, Laylatul Qadr, inshallah, just in time for the last 10 days of Ramadan, where you could try to find that auspicious night. Number 21, Itikaf. Number 22, episode number 22, Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islam, part one. And followed by, on the 23rd, Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islam, part two. And the third day after that, episode 24, Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islam, part three. Episode 25, Ramadan, the month of self-improvement in Islam, part four. Episode 26, Dawa to non-Muslims in the month of Ramadan. Episode 27 is Qadda fasts, Fidya and Kafara fasts. Episode 28 is Sighting of the Moon. Episode 29 is Zakat al-Fitra. Episode 30 is Eid al-Fitr. And Episode 31 is voluntary fasts and prohibited fasts. And finally, last but not least, episode 32, from this Ramadan until the next. Dr. Zakir, particularly, what are your comments on the selection of these topics? Alhamdulillah, all the topics that we have discussed and have categorized, alhamdulillah, into different days, so that it will benefit the viewers knowing about the details of the month of Ramadan. And it will also help me in replying to the question they're going to pose to me, because many a times, some of the questions, they will overlap. So I will see to it that I reply specifically on the day that the topic I've asked, and I see to it that I will reply in detail on that specific day. And if it's supposed to be mentioned earlier, then maybe I will just give a brief comment. But one point to be noted is that most of these topics, I feel, should be discussed much before the month of Ramadan starts. There may be few topics which may be discussed any time of the year. For example, voluntary fast. These topics can be discussed any time of the year. There are some topics like Atikaf and Laylatul Qad, which should be discussed just before the last 10 days, which we'll be doing, inshallah. And some topics like Eid al-Fitr should be discussed just before Eid. But most of the topics that we'll be discussing, they should be discussed before Ramadan. For example, we will be discussing Iftar and Suhoor on the eighth day. We'll be discussing things or acts that invalidate the fast on the fifth day. And we will be starting our fast on the first day of Ramadan. So it doesn't make sense. So actually we should start much before, at least three or four weeks before the month of Ramadan begins. But I do agree that the reason we are starting from day one of Ramadan is because more of Muslims watch the Islamic programs in the month of Ramadan than on any other days. So the viewership in the month of Ramadan is much higher so Alhamdulillah, it's right that we're starting on day one, but it should be shown again maybe after a few months so that it is a preparation for the next Ramadan. MashaAllah. Well, all the topics, Dr. Zakir, seem to have been logically positioned and scientifically chosen by yourself. Um, uh, one thing I do appreciate, though, is that um, we've added in the first couple of topics, which are let's welcome Ramadan. So that's very logical that the first day Everybody's very keen to, you know, go about Ramadan in the proper ways. So that'll, be, that'll be very beneficial for the viewers. And secondly, common errors which are committed by Muslims during this month, the second day. So the first two days are health warnings, if you like. Right. Yeah? Right. Alhamdulillah. Now, let's go straight into the questions regarding the preparation 
What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do in order to uh, welcome Ramadan? What was his preparation for Ramadan? The hadith which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Ram number 3, Book of Fasting, hadith number 1969, the wife of the Prophet, Hadad Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she says that the Prophet, he never fasted any month completely except the month of Ramadan. And in no month did he fast as many days as he fasted in the month of Shaban. So from this hadith we come to know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in order to welcome the month of Ramadan, he is to start, he is to prepare himself and fast more in the previous month, that is the month of Shaban. That was his way how he used to prepare for the month of Ramadan. And further if you read the Sahih Hadith in Tirmidhi, chapter number 50, Hadith number 3451, which says that Talha, may Allah be pleased with him, he said on the authority of his father, that his father, that is his grandfather, he said, whenever the Prophet saw the new moon, he used to always pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, O oh Allah, bless us in this month. And he used to mention the name of that month. And then say that please keep us steadfast in faith in this month. This was the way the Prophet always used to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever he saw a new moon. It wasn't specifically only for the new moon of the month of Ramadan, but it was for all new moons whenever he used to see. And his special way of welcoming the month of Ramadan was that he used to mention about the coming of this blessed month to the people. And it's mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, Ram number 2, page number 230, hadith number 7148, where Prophet Muhammad he used to tell the people that, O oh people, this blessed month is approaching you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for you that you fast in this month. And the gates of heaven will be open in this month. And the gates of hell will be closed. And the devils will be chained. And in this month, there is a night which is better than a thousand months. And if anyone is deprived of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessing in this month, he is truly a deprived person. So here we come to know that this is how Prophet Muhammad used to welcome this month and he used to tell the good news of the blessed month to come to all the people. MashaAllah. The next question to you is, what should we do when Ramadan approaches? The first thing we should do is we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us witness this blessed month of Ramadan once again. And we have to thank him for his mercy and we have to ask forgiveness in this month so that all our previous sins will be forgiven. And we have to thank him for all the niyamat he has given us, all the blessings, all the love. This is the best month. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, it says, Shahru Ramzan nas which means that Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance for mankind and signs for guidance and judgment between right and wrong. And Allah further says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, Allah says, Ya amanu, O you who believe, O oh, you believe, fasting was prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you so that you may learn self-restraint. The word used here is tattakun, similar to taqwa, so that you learn God consciousness, so that you learn piety, so that you learn righteousness. So this is the month in which a person can become more righteous. This is the time when our taqwa can be the highest. And this is a month, it is an annual training. It is a sort of an overhauling of the body. How we have that every machinery requires some sort of servicing. 
maybe every three months, maybe every year. And if you allow me to call the human beings as the best machinery in the world, doesn't it require a servicing or overhauling? So Ramadan is an annual overhauling of the human body. It is a spiritual and moral training for the human being. And it is a purification of the body, mind, and soul. This is the month where we can increase our taqwa. We can increase our patience. And we can derive the benefits and the guidance from the Quran. SubhanAllah. Jazakallah khair. Beautiful answer. Next question. What are your particular words of advice regarding the, on the occasion of Ramadan approaching us? My advice would be that every Muslim, he or she, should make it a point that they should make a resolution that they should fast each and every day of this blessed month of Ramadan. And we should try and acquire all the benefits of this month. And we should not waste a single minute in this blessed month on things which are trivial. And try and concentrate as much as possible in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should try and look for His mercy. We have to try and ask for forgiveness. We have to try and seek for His love. And we have to try and increase our piety, our righteousness, and our patience. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Sahih Bukhari, verse number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1903, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, anyone who does not leave the false action and false speech, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala does not care if he leaves his eating and drinking. That means if a person does not abstain from false action and false speech, mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not care if you abstain from food and drink. That means your fasting will not be accepted unless you stay away from false action and false speech. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad he also said, it's mentioned in Sahih Hadith, which is written in Musnad Ahmad, Ram number two, page number 230, hadith number 7148, and it also appears in Sunan Nisai, chapter number five, hadith number 2106, where our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, O oh people, the blessed month of Ramadan is approaching, and Allah has ordained for you that you fast in this month. And the gates of heaven will be open in this month. And the gates of hell will be closed. And the devils, they will be chained. And this month is the night, which is better than a thousand months. And if a person is deprived of the blessings in this month, he is truly a deprived person. So we have to make it a point that we gain the benefits of this blessed month. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1901. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who fasts in this month with faith, seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all his past sins will be forgiven. That means if we truly with sincerity, fast in this month and seek the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all our past sins will be forgiven. Imagine, it is such an easy way to have our sins forgiven of the past. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1904. This is a very long hadith, which has basically four points. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that all the children of Adam all the deeds that they do are for themselves, except for fasting. Fasting is for me, and I will reward him. And he further said that fasting is a shield. It prevents you from sin. And the person who observes the fast, he should abstain from obscenity, from yelling, and from ignorance. And if someone yells at him or abuses him, he should say, I am fasting, I am fasting. 
And the third point our beloved Prophet said in this hadith is that I swear by Allah in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad وسلم, that the breath of a faster, the person who fasts, is sweeter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the scent of musk. Allah. And he finally said in this hadith that there are two things when a faster is happy and looks forward to it. The first is when he breaks the fast and the second is when he meets the Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And further, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31. It says, O you believe, truly have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek the bliss. That means try and enter Jannah. It's mentioned in Surah Aqaf, chapter number 46, verse number 13 and 14, that those are the people who worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are steadfast in faith. The word is istikam. They are steadfast in faith that there's only one Allah and no one else. And they shall not have any fear, nor they shall grieve. These are the people who are the people of paradise. And they shall be rewarded for all the goods they have done. Allah. So this is advice for the people that they should take the best of this month and should not spend time on trivial things and spend their time in the worship of Allah and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking for forgiveness. MashaAllah. Next question is, you've alluded to that in some of the beautiful hadiths you've mentioned just now, but um, what specific reason is it that Ramadan is called the month of forgiveness or is known as the month of yes, forgiveness? Yes, as I rightly mentioned earlier, that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's in a hadith of Sahih Bukhari, Ram number three, Book of Fasting, Hadith number 1901. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that if anyone fasts in the month of Ramadan with the proper intention, with faith, and asking for reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will forgive all your past sins. And this message is further repeated in the Musnad Ahmad, volume number three, Hadith number 11524 where it's mentioned that any person who fasts in the month of Ramadan with the proper intention, seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will have all his previous sins atoned. And further it's mentioned in Sai Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 450, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, that the time between the five prayers and the two Jummas and from one Ramadan to the other is the time for expiation of your sins. This is the time where you can have all your sins forgiven. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad also said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, verse number four, in the book of Tawbah, Hadith number 6644, a beloved Prophet Muhammad said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night time, a person who asks for forgiveness, he forgives the sin for the sin he has committed in the day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the daytime, he forgives the sin for a person who asks for forgiveness for the sin he has committed at night. So this is the best month of forgiveness, the month of Ramadan, where you can easily have your sins forgiven because the gates of heaven open and the gates of hell are closed. Therefore, it's called the month of forgiveness. Allahu Akbar. No wonder everybody wants to be active in that month. Now we know why. SubhanAllah. Dr. Zakia, um, are there any particular activities a Muslim should concentrate upon during this blessed month of Ramadan? And of course, we should um, relate to you the importance of the fact that our viewers really can gain massive benefit by knowing specific activities they can get involved in and they can start planning the Ramadan now. Yes, I believe that this is a very good question because most of the activities we'll be dealing as time goes on in the episode. But just to give a brief outline, I will just specify a few important, because the whole answer will take very long. Yeah. The few important points that will be noted is that number one, it is the niyyah. The niyyah is very important. The niyyah of fasting should only be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for a fasting to be accepted, the niyyah is important. So making the niyyah is very important. 
without which the fasting will not be accepted. Number two is observing the sunnah of the fast that we'll be dealing in detail in the next few days. But just a point to be noted that one of the important sunnah is that we should have suhur as late as possible, that is just before the break of dawn, just before Fajr Salah, and we should break our fast, have iftar as early as possible, immediately after sunset. Furthermore, in this blessed month, we should be careful and we should avoid all things which are prohibited, which are haram, and all things which are makro. And this is the best opportunity where a person, if he has certain activities which are against the Sharia, whether he's doing haram activities or makro activities, this is the best time he can abstain from it. And that will be a good habit which inshallah he may abstain maybe throughout his life. For example, if a person is habituated to drinking alcohol, if he can abstain from having alcohol from the break of dawn to sunset, he can abstain from it from the cradle to the grave. Similarly, we should take care that we should abstain from things which are makru. For example, it is makru to stand and drink water. And if you have to do that, so see to it that in this month of Ramadan, while having water, we should sit down. This was the sunnah of the Prophet. So it's a good month in which you can abstain from the haram activities which you have been doing, maybe some of them, or the makru activities. Furthermore, it's a good time where you can implement many of the sunnah of the Prophet in your day-to-day -day life. For example, maybe sporting a beard. Many Muslims don't have a beard. So it's a good month where you can follow the sunnah of the Prophet. The sunnah of the Prophet about the duas of when you enter the home, when you leave the toilet, the dua that is there when you're traveling in a vehicle. So this is a good month in which you can adopt as much as sunnah as possible so that we can be on the straight path. This is a very good month where you should see to it that you should offer the salah. Not only the five times salah, which is the fard, even try and offer as many nawafil and sunnah. And if you're not habituated to reading in congregation, see to it that you're in a congregation and as far as possible, go to the mosque for the salah. In this month, we should be particular that we do not miss the tarawih. Many people think, and it is a fact that it is a sunnah, but many people think that because it is a sunnah, we can miss tarawih. Tarawih is a very important sunnah. Though it's not a fard, but every Muslim should make it a point that as far as possible, they should attend tarawih because of the blessings it has. So tarawih is very important, which Muslims should never miss. And when we offer Taravi, many of us, we rush through Taravi because we want to complete the Quran. And many of them read the Taravi 100 miles per hour. We should read the Taravi with patience at a moderate pace so that people can understand what is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that if time permits and if possible, we should try and do etikaf in the last 10 days. And while doing etikaf, make it a point that we don't socialize. Many will make a mistake of socializing during etikaf. So the whole purpose of etikaf is defeated. Furthermore, we should do more dua in this month. We should do more supplications. This is the month of dua. And we should do more zikr. Spend time in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also worshipping Him. This is the month in which we should try and read as much as Quran as possible. Besides reciting the Quran in Arabic, if you know Arabic as a language, then there's no problem. But if you don't know, then also read the translation of the Quran in the language we understand the best. If you understand English, read in English. If you understand Urdu, read in Urdu. Read it in the language you understand the best. But while reciting the Quran, for which you get a sawab, also read the translation of the Quran so that you can implement on the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If possible, read the Quran once in every seven days, or at least read one juz every day so that you complete the Quran at least once in the full month of Ramadan. In this month, try and read as much as hadith as possible. But see to it that you read the authentic hadith. 
and the best book on hadith is the book of Sayy al-Bukhari. Then it's Sayy Muslim. You can read the other Qutub al also. But read authentic books on hadith. Read books on the lifestyle and the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See to it that if you have not given the zakat, please give the zakat which is an obligatory charity. And every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of his saving every lunar year in charity, that is zakat. And many people, they do not calculate the zakat properly. You make it a point that you calculate the zakat honestly, and it is better to give a little bit more rather than to give less. So calculate it properly and see to it that you give your zakat. And this Ramadan is a month of generosity. It's a month of sadqa. And you get 10 times more reward for your good deeds. So this is the month where you should do maximum charity. And besides that, we should make it a point that during this month, we should be cheerful. Many of the Muslims, they look dull, they look gloomy. We should be cheerful and happy. And we should give more time to our family. Many times we neglect our family. We just see to it that we give more time to our family and do all these activities collectively. We should also have husni saluk to the people around you. That means we should deal with the other human beings with mercy, with love, with care. If they have done some mistakes, they forgive them. This is a month of forgiveness. If you have done something wrong to them, ask for forgiveness. Live with the people around you with love, care, and with affection. We should to tafakkul. That means ponder on the things. See to it that you plan your month of Ramadan. Plan it properly. And see to it that you do not waste not even a minute, not even a second. This is the month of gaining. And this month is the best month for self-improvement also. And besides that, you should also make it a point to do islah with your other Muslim brothers and sisters. It's also the best month to do da'wah. That is, convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. So it's my request to the brothers and sisters that plan your month efficiently and see to it that you utilize every second of this blessed month. Amen. Dr. Zakir, Ramadan is a month of opportunities. It's a month of blessed opportunities. What are the conditions that a person needs to have these uh, deeds accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The basic two conditions are, number one, is the intention. It should only be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. Whatever deed you do, it should only be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. This is very important. If this condition is not met, then all your deeds are wasted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Bayyana, chapter number 98, verse number 5, it says, that you worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you do it only for him and for no one else. It is further mentioned in Surah Insan, chapter number 76, verse number 9. It says that we have fed you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not require any reward from you, nor do we require any returns. That means if you feed someone, it is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not seeking a reward or not seeking anything in return. This is a very important factor that we should note. All your actions should be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a very important factor. And further it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 20, that if you do a deed for the tilt, for the reward in the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will multiply your reward your tilt in the hereafter. And if you do a deed or any action for a reward in this world, Allah will give you the reward in this world, but you'll have no share in the hereafter. Allah repeated that message in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 15 and 16, that anyone who seeks the reward in this world or does any deed for this world and for the glitter of this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surely give him in this world. But he will have no share in the hereafter except fire, except hell. 
and all his deeds will not be useful in the hereafter. So therefore, whatever we do should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second caliph of Islam, Hadrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, hadith number one. Hadrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Innamal amala bidniya, which means your deeds are judged on your intention. And the Prophet further said that all your actions are based on your intention. And anyone who has migrated for Allah and His Rasul, he has migrated for Allah and His Rasul. If anyone has an hijra migrated for the worldly benefits or for marriage, he has migrated for the worldly benefits and marriage. So niyah is very important. And this is further repeated in another hadith, in Sahih Muslim, volume number four, hadith number 7114. It says that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I am alone sufficient. I do not require any associate. And if anyone does any deed for anyone else, as well as for me, I renounce that for the person who he has associated to. That means you can't do part of the deed for Allah and part for someone else. You have to do completely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only for him and no one else. Allah does not like anyone associating anything with him. That's very important. So this is the basic point that is the niyyah. The second point to be noted for our deed to be acceptable is that our deed should be based on the sharia. It should be in accordance to Allah and His Rasul. Accordance to the teachings of the Quran and teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number three, hadith number 4267, where our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that if your deeds and actions are not according to our way, according to the religion of Islam, according to Quran and Sahih Hadith, then that is rejected. That means for your deeds to be accepted, it should be according to Quran and Sahih Hadith. And it's also mentioned in another Sahih Hadith of Abu Dawud, volume number three, Hadith number 4950, our beloved Prophet said that he told the people that follow my example and the example of Khulfa Rashidin, that's the rightly guided caliphs. So if you follow them and cling to it with eye teeth, that means strongly follow it. The sunnah of the Prophet, my sunnah, the Prophet said that his sunnah, his way, and the way of the Khulfa Rashidin, that is rightly guided caliphs. So for a deed to be accepted, a niyah should be only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it should be according to the Sharia, Quran and Sahih Hadith. Subhanallah. Jazakallah khair for those answers. Now, alhamdulillah, this is the part of the show, as we promised that if, time permitting, we had time to uh, receive some of your questions relating to the topic, we would do so, and we do have a little bit of time. So, Dr. Zakir, why is it that Ramadan specifically is put on its own in terms of uh, it being welcomed? What about other months like Hajj, the month of Hajj, etc.? The reason we Muslims welcome the month of Ramadan, all the months in the year are good, alhamdulillah. But the reason we specifically welcome the month of Ramadan, because Ramadan is a month of forgiveness. It is a month where I mentioned earlier, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that the doors of heaven will be opened. The gates of hell will be closed. And the devils will be chained. So because of this reason, this month is welcome. And whatever we ask for forgiveness, as the beloved Prophet said, that if we fast for the full month of Ramadan with the true intention and with proper faith, asking reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all our past sins will be forgiven. Mentioned Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, book of fasting, hadith number 1901. So because of this purpose, this month is welcomed. So that we look forward for our sins to be forgiven and for our deeds to be multiplied, our good deeds to be multiplied. That is the reason specifically we Muslims, we welcome this month of Ramadan. MashaAllah. Next question of quite equal importance actually is about how people 
welcome Ramadan with certain sayings. Ramadan Mubarak. Some people say it's a bidah and others say it's a sunnah. What is your uh, ruling on this? To welcome month is good, Alhamdulillah. And our Prophet always informed the other people about this month. And as I mentioned earlier, that a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu it's mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, Ram number two, page number 230, Hadith number 7148, which is also repeated. It is mentioned in Sunan Nisai, chapter number five, Hadith number 2106, that our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to always tell the people when the month used to approach, when it used to come. The Prophet used to tell the people in advance, O oh people, the blessed month of Ramadan is approaching you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for you that you fast in this month. And the gates of heaven will be opened, and the gates of hell will be closed, and the Satan will be chained. And in this month is the night of Qadr, which is better than a thousand months. And if you will be deprived of the sawab, of the blessings, you are really a deprived person. So the Prophet used to welcome this month. He used to wish other people. The same way today, if we wish, as the Prophet said, the blessed month is approaching. If someone says Ramadan Mubarak, this Ramadan Mubarak is more often said in the Indian subcontinent, by the Indians, by the Pakistanis, because this word Mubarak, though Barqa is an Arabic word, Barqa means blessing, and it is nothing but blessed month. But when the Indians and Pakistanis, when they use the word Mubarak, it is more of a sort of congratulation. When someone passes examination, they say Mubarak in Urdu, which is derived from the Arabic word Barqa. So when Ramadan comes, they wish Ramadan Mubarak, saying that it is the blessed month, or a sort of congratulating and wishing each other that the blessed month is approaching. So according to me, it's not a bidah. You can welcome the month. It's a good thing that you're calling this month a blessed month, and you're informing other people, reminding them that in this month is a lot of blessing. So according to me, it's not a bidah. But how you wish, the word you choose, that is Mubah, that's optional. Like in Indian subcontinent, we use the word Ramadan Mubarak. In the Gulf countries, they use Ramadan Kareem. So all these words are good, the holy month or the blessed month or the month of forgiveness. So the choice of the words is yours. But the Prophet Muhammad he used to say to the people that, oh people, the blessed month of Ramadan is approaching. So I feel people should wish each other and they should remind each other about this blessed month. MashaAllah. JazakAllah khair, Dr. Zakir Naik. That brings an end to the questions, unfortunately. We don't have more time. Otherwise, you can answer so many others that we've received on email from our viewers of PCV. Brothers and sisters, JazakAllah khair. It has been an absolute pleasure listening to Dr. Zakir Naik's uh, answers today on Let's Welcome Ramadan. Tomorrow, we'll be discussing common errors which are made by Muslims during the month of Ramadan. So I hope you'll join us then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. يومنا صبر ورق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأقل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوفيق